the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. The idea of everyone having savings that are legitimate, that benefit from being on a gold standard. Savings and banking doesn't have to be in the traditional means anymore. Financial technology has allowed us to very easily own gold and transact, denominating our savings in gold versus greenbacks. So you can establish your house on a firmer foundation and not the house of cards. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Well, we talk about your weekend adventures because you really have them, Dave. Uh, you had never run a marathon before. You know, Granted, you had done the half Ironman. You had done some of those, but you had never actually run a full marathon. And so when you told me that that was what you planned on doing, you then told me, where it was going to be and the moab utah marathon and not only with the huge elevation gains and the strange terrain is just normally full of surprises and i don't know anybody who makes that their first marathon <laughs> well it was i made sure to tell the whole family that the first guy who ran the marathon because this goes back thousands of years ago the first guy who ran the marathon died right. he ran his 26 miles and then dropped it it yeah. delivered his message and it was done and i had no intention of dying but i said I really don't know what's going to happen. I've never run that far in my life. But I did kind of map things out, and I know how fast I can generally run. And, you know, I knew there was going to be a few tough spots because some of the hills were really rigorous. Well, and you sort of planned for that because your son was there waiting for you. And you said, all right, this is about the time I think it's going to take. And you, you were generous with the time, but you had planned for the unexpected. Except that one of those hills took a lot longer than I thought. I thought I could run it at a certain pace and it ended up being four to five minutes slower per mile. I mean, it was unbelievable believably just 1200 feet of vertical nobody was taking that at a fast pace well you know and our guest last week Ed Easterling talked about how you really cannot look at the short term you have to plan for the unexpected and you can't really measure investment success unless you're looking at a complete secular cycle and our guest in a few weeks is also going to bring out that even banking can't be measured unless you look through a full credit cycle that can be you know, 30, 40 years. I think there's one thing I learned from the marathon is you can't go out too fast. You know, there's a lot of enthusiasm the morning of, mm. and you feel fresh the first mile. Actually, you feel fresh the first five or six or seven miles. But you can't go out too fast because you're not running for the first five miles. You're running for the last three, four, five You have miles. really learned that in triathlon, all right? And talking about the unexpected, because we try to deal with finance and politics and geopolitics on this show, things have been smoothed out so dramatically by the printing of money. In a way, the unexpected has been removed or surprise seems to have been removed from the market. But, you know, in reality, this thing we call quantitative easing, it's nothing new. This is something that's gone on for hundreds, even thousands of years. Well, in different forms, I think where it was formalized and where it became a part of the structure and was really managed, John Law did the best job, I think. Um, <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah, he, he managed yeah. it well in the beginning. I, I think he probably came out a little too fast. And yeah. how it finished was was people wanting him to go to the guillotine. But, you know, again, he came out really <laughs> fast and it was a very impressive showing those first couple of miles. John Law and Richard Cantillon, this is sort of the original QE formalized, codified within monetary policy, you know, organized and complemented by fiscal policy efforts there in France. Uh, 300 and, years ago. That's three, yeah. exactly 300 years ago. So, I mean, I think the next round and why that's apropos today is the next round may be 2019. That could mm. be a 2019 event. There's some ambiguity there, though. The ambiguity for market participants is that the Powell administration, the current leadership of the Federal Reserve, brings in a lot of uncertainty into the picture because more QE would, of course, be in response to a rotten stock market. Right. More QE could be good for stocks, could be bad for bonds. It could be 
good for bonds and bad for stocks, and it could be bad for both if it's treated differently in, in sort of a fresh context. Well, let me ask you, though, okay, because it's just like any other type of stimulus response. The more you continue to stimulate, the less the response. Do you think that the QE is going to have sort of a numbed down effect compared to what we've seen back early on when people were not expecting it? Yeah. And again, I, I, I liken that to the race. I do have caffeine. When I do a race like this, I do have some caffeine that's introduced into the system at some point mm. and it is a jolt but you don't want to do it too early no if you do it too yeah. early you find that you're collapsing at some point in the race so when do you apply that too early and it's a mistake right and too late and it didn't do you any good really so i think the timing is critical the key the scale of what they're doing will be critical my sense is that you know the next QE is likely to lack the wow factor, mm. whatever the scale. And yeah, I think where we'll see significant pressure is in the currency markets. And so you know, as we begin to see that QE announced, that I think is the time frame that you see a couple of convergences. Not only the Dow and the S and P and the Nasdaq selling off, but again you've got a policy response to that which triggers weakness in the underlying currency. I think that's the context where you see, you know, Alan Newman's projection of the Dow at 14,000 and gold creeping towards the 2,500 to even 5,000 mark in that range, because that gets you back to a ratio of six to one. We had the six to one ratio in 2011, 2012, and I think we'll break through the six to one ratio this time and land at more of a three to one ratio. Three to one ratio is $4,900 gold and 14,000 Dow. Not a complete failure of the Dow. Nothing like what the Prechter folks would see as sort of a cataclysm taking us down 60, 80%, but still a very, very, very healthy the correction. Well, and Newman has said himself that the correction that we had back in 2008 that got us down to six to one was not the completion of that cycle. He's really looking for a five, four, three, two, or even a one to one ratio on the Dow. But let me ask you about raising rates in December, because, you know, the economy right now still seems from a standard economics perspective that it's chugging along hard and that Powell probably I'm thinking he's got pressure on him to raise rates in December. I think Powell's the linchpin. I, I don't know what he can tolerate in terms of social pressure or political pressure. But as you look at the economic stats on GDP and employment, the official stats do argue for a raising of rates in December. And so if Chairman Powell remains data bound, then you've got the liquidity tightening, which we've witnessed globally, that will be exacerbated. And of course, a lot of the Volatility that we've seen this year and acutely here in October, you know, we definitely have seen a lot of that in the third quarter as well in, in the emerging markets leading into October. That liquidity tightening is going to be exacerbated by the next lifting of interest rates. Well, it's interesting, too, because we are seeing inflation tick up pretty quickly. And, you know, you had mentioned John Law and Cantillon, but actually they're best known, John Law especially, for hyperinflation, a hyperinflationary collapse at the end. Well, and, and I think I mentioned John Law and Cantillon because I do expect massive intervention at a certain pain threshold. Right. Now, later this year, we'll take a deeper look at Cantillon in particular. I think he's sort of a neglected name in economics and banking, but I think he offers a very fascinating lens through which we can see John Law, who was infamous as sort of the pre-incarnation of Keynes in what today is considered normal monetary policy and has been adopted as such the world over. But he implemented the same kinds of things with his version of QE, created the Mississippi bubble. And I think you really have to appreciate fully what the Mississippi bubble was fully as an analog to the contemporary central bank monetary policy making. Lest we sound like a broken record, but I guess it's okay to uh, we'll recommend the book one more time, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by McKay that was written in the 1850s, long before the new economics that we supposedly have today. And it tells about the Mississippi bubble. But, you know, there are other economists that talk about these surprise occasions that can just shock you. I mean, out of nowhere, they're surprised. And we're actually going to have a guest on in a few weeks who talks about how why the market is always surprised when it's surprised. But Hyman Minsky talked an awful lot about surprise to the point where we've actually termed a phrase called the Minsky moment. That's right. Hyman Minsky argued that it's good times. It's great success 
these things are the prevenient causes, the causes that come before major market chaos and crisis. And that's his financial instability hypothesis. Is that just another way of saying pride comes before the fall? I mean, it, that really is when things are going well, pride starts creeping in and risk taking goes way beyond what it should. I don't know if it's pride, but there is certainly a neglect to risk as people are emboldened with success. So mm -hmm. embedded in the thesis and within the rupture of, of the Minsky moment, when you know, good quickly turns to bad is misallocated capital. It's the accumulation of bad loans and it's unsound investments finally being revealed. So again, you know, you're moving along and everything's going fine and everybody's paying their bills. And then all of a sudden you look and you say, wait a minute, I shouldn't have loaned money to that person or this business really didn't have a very good solid business plan. And it's as the tide goes out that all these things begin to be revealed, but you don't see that until the Minsky moment. Many people had not even heard of Hyman Minsky until 2008, and then he seemed to get an awful lot of press. You know, his popularity reemerged in 2008 as a number of his ideas provided a plausible explanation for the chaos in the markets. So you had Nuriel Rubini, uh, Paul Krugman, there's a number of people who have been influenced by his thinking. But again, they gave an explanation. You know, you had Federal Reserve officials, you had White House financial planners and policy advisors they failed to see it coming, and so they started looking for a possible explanation. All they had was good news to report. How could something so catastrophic emerge from out of the blue? Mm. And I think Minsky might say it didn't emerge out of the blue. It emerged out of the green. Mm. You know, so you've got sure first money. you get your money flows, and then you've got confidence that builds, and then that leads to excessive risk taking, with there being a final consequential chapter in a boom to bust saga. One of the things that I can't believe we don't see coming is when companies no longer have to make any money. Back in the late 1990s, we would see these dot com companies companies come out and they had absolutely no profit. They maybe had hope for profit five years, 10 years down the road, but they were hugely funded with IPOs. And if it had dot com on it, you bought it. The problem was there was no need to make money. So when does making money make a difference? Yeah, I think actually that suggests that we're in that final chapter yet again. You roll back the clock to the founding of Amazon, and this is one of those dot-com babies that went bust. Not completely bust, but I mean, you look at the takedown in share price, and it didn't have to make money in the context of raising money in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. It washed out and nearly went bankrupt in the early aughts, and fortunately it has recovered to become what it is. But here again, we're repeating this. Could the fact that making money is no longer a prerequisite for companies to go public, does that show us a little of that embedded risk that Minsky was alluding to, where people just stop paying attention to risk? And that's actually how things are so good. Times are so good that you're no longer paying attention to what could cause you to trip or stumble. Well, looking at the last year, okay, we've had an awful lot of companies come to light. Uh, how many of those companies actually are turning a profit right now? And again, I, maybe I'm stuck on the marathon, but I, I think there's every step that matters. And particularly on a trail run, you can turn your ankle on every stone and root. Right. And you have to constantly pay attention. It doesn't matter how you feel. If you're not aware constantly of what can trip you up, you will be tripped up. And it's actually a very different race than a typical marathon because you can just kind of get into a mode and mindlessly go for it with a regular run. Do you remember in the book Born to Run, which is about that kind of trail running? You know, he said, when you're out there and you have to make a decision as to whether to take one step or two, take three. That's right. And you just, you're slowing down. You're not stretching things out. You're actually bringing more caution in. If it could be done in two, take three. Yeah. So these companies that have gone public this year, 83% of companies. 83% of companies that have gone public this year, I mean, obviously to great fanfare, they wouldn't be going to the public to raise capital, but 83% of them have had negative earnings yeah. over the last 12 months. They're not making any <laughs> that's, money. That's amazing. To me. It, that appears to be a market profile of investors clinging to hope of seeing that it's ideas, it's not return on investment that matters anymore. Maybe every company will be the next Amazon and make no money for a decade. Before but is this just your issue, Dave? I mean, I'm glad that you like to make money because I work for a company that really needs to turn a profit to pay their people. Is it just your issue? 
No, I, I, Jay Ritter, Robert Prechter, Mark Faber, they certainly think this is an issue. I remember back to when we were doing an interview with the CEO of Overstock.com. Yeah. And, you know, I looked at their numbers and I thought, how is this possible? I mean, the guy's making a couple million bucks a year. The company doesn't make any money, but everyone is making money off of the company. And it really relies on investors throwing capital at this thing, hoping that it someday works. But it is working. It's working for everyone in the company. <laughs> this the investors that are getting shined. I mean, that's really what's happening. And you've got to really drum up some enthusiasm for investors to be like, hey, I don't care about return on capital. Not for a long, long time. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. Like we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, everybody's a long-term investor until something bad happens. And it's like, what is long-term? Long-term is 10 seconds if you're experiencing excruciating pain. You know, Dave, we've all known people like that in our own circles. Okay, where the, you've got this guy who who's always driving a Mercedes, BMW, whatever it is. And he is always raising funds for the next project. But you never see, as you look through your life, you never see any of those projects actually come to fruition. It's just continually raising funds, you right. know, raising capital. Snap was a similar case in point two years ago. Huh. Um, it went public in March of 2017, launched from an IPO price of 17, it went to 29. And it didn't have profits then. It still doesn't have profits today. And as time has worn on, that's become a concern. And I think it's a part of that little micro saga. You've got 80% decline here recently in the price hmm. of those shares. And it's, it's just curious. A good looking IPO is like a good looking date. There has to be more substance to ultimately go the distance in a lasting relationship. Right. It can't just be, wow, this is really interesting, so beautiful, quite handsome. You know, there are Minsky relational moments. Minsky would probably scold me for abusing this idea now. <laughs> now, but you're, now you're on dating. Yeah. yeah you're you're going to talk to your kids about this. I know. Yeah. Well, we, we try to think laterally. Yeah, I, I think there are Minsky relational moments for those that don't holistically manage a balance sheet of intangible assets. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, nothing detrimental about good times, so long as you've built reserves for the days of challenge and distress. And that, that's that's where you know you, you take advantage of having a successful business to be able to reserve. You know, we should not be surprised. What's the bottom line here? We should not be surprised by the volatility we saw in October 2018, 2019 being a continuation of what we saw both in early February of this year, as well as the replay in October. Volatility is reemerged as so many popular bets in the market are grinding through cash without profit to show for the effort. Right. You know, and the thing is, look at these companies that may be facing something that they absolutely have no control over. OK, take Uber, for an example. They've been just hiring people as contractors. And now they face the possibility of going out of business if they have to actually call them employees. I use Uber just about everywhere I travel to. It's very convenient. But Uber is a business model. And they don't pay medical I don't know what they pay, but I, it's not like having an employee. Right. No, it's very scalable, but they do face some legislative challenges. I mean, if you want to call it legislative challenges, but you know, they are a big percentage of the ride hail market, close to 70%, mm. you know, compared to Lyft and some of the other popular apps that allow you to get a car on short notice. But their margins, you look at their margins, you know, think about this. They have improved from a negative 31%. So this is EBITDA margins. So they were losing 30 cents for every dollar that they brought in? Yeah, 31 and a half cents. Now they're only losing about 16 cents. So it's negative 16% margins compared to negative 31%. So that's an improvement. But at the same time, as a company, they're seeing deceleration. Right. And you mentioned the showdown. That's the big deal. The big issue moving forward is the legal classification of the drivers. Are all those drivers employees or are they contractors? To this point, they've been treated as contractors. If the conclusion is that they're employees, that company is toast. And we're right. talking about a company that's supposed to come public at an IPO of $120 billion market cap. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's, that's pending. That's, that's eminent, right? But if they are employees, right. what do you have to do? You know, they lost in the first half of this year, excluding a one-time gain. They lost $1.3 billion in the first half of this year. And that's still calling their employees contractors. That's right. Uh, that does not include the expenses that they'd have to shoulder under an employee classification, federal tax withholding, 
medical insurance, workers' comp insurance, any other benefit costs that, you know, an HR department normally manages. Mm-hmm. So you've got the drivers who are not happy. They've got roughly a 25% annual driver attrition, uh, according to a survey done by the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I don't know if that's objective or not. <laughs> probably uh, not, but it's probably close it, enough. Right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And a decline in monthly pay. I talk to every Uber driver that I'm engaged with and you know, some fascinating conversations. There are some amazingly smart Uber drivers knowing where to be at the right time. The best conversation I had of late with an Uber driver was in Atlanta. Hmm. And this gal was from Venezuela. And she told me the story about how really she, Venezuela. Yeah. Wow. She remitted about $150, $200 a month to her mom in Venezuela. And her mom lives like a queen on $200 a month sure. in Venezuela. Because everybody else is starving right now. Yep. Yeah. Her brother sends another $100 and they're there to study. They're there to get degrees and they really don't have a desire to go back. Not mm-hmm. at this point. And she's a driver. That's how she yep. pays for this. That's exactly right. And I asked her, so what's changed? And she hasn't been driving long enough to give me a contrast, but JP Morgan did a study and monthly pay for the Uber drivers has come down 53% hmm. since 2013. So what was a great deal a few years ago has been the only means by which Uber hasn't shown horrific numbers. They've shown bad numbers quarter after quarter after quarter, but they haven't been horrific because they've squeezed the drivers. So good ideas don't necessarily make money. Well, I mean, and, and think about this. I mean, it just for the listener out there, is Ford a substantive company? Do they make products? Does Is GM a substantive company? Do they make products? Of course, Chrysler you know, almost went broke and was bought out by Fiat, but now you've got Fiat Chrysler. Combine the market caps of Ford, GM, and Fiat Chrysler, and the Uber IPO will make them look like a nothing, nobody upstart. The market hmm. caps of those three companies are smaller than the expected IPO of Uber. And it, it doesn't make any money. It's losing several billion dollars a year. What is this? Well, again, just like a replay back in the old dot-com days, back in the late 90s, we live in an age where finance, creative finance especially, is more important than actual accounting. <laughs> we saw that uncovered with Enron. We saw that uncovered with WorldCom. Right. We saw that uncovered with Arthur Anderson. And this is an accounting firm, right? Mm-hmm. But it's creative finance and it's structured finance that allows for a lot of things that, you know, again, it's just it's new thinking. On that same point, Harvard Business Review the article I would recommend reading, why we need to update financial reporting for the digital era. It's fa- absolutely fascinating. Why this time is different. Yeah. The author, <laughs> what he does right. is he interviews a bunch of tech company CFOs and the author tries to enter the mind of the tech company CFO. Some of the telling conclusions from, you know, your, your chief executive officer, your chief financial officer, all of your C-suite folks. And this was brought to my attention by Jim Grant. Investors are paying more attention to ideas and options rather than earnings. That's one conclusion that CFOs are, well, of course, this is, they care about ideas, not earnings. Another conclusion was that accounting is no longer considered a value added function. (laughs) Why count? If the money keeps flowing in, you don't need to count. Right, right. right. Well, and and I guess if you're talking about capital raising, it doesn't really matter what's in your piggy bank Oh, I didn't mean profits coming in. I meant capital coming in. Right, right. The calculation of gap, this is the general accepting accounting principles, the calculation of gap-based profitability. This is a conclusion of the CFOs in Techlandia. It's a hindrance and it's a distraction to their internal resource allocation decisions. Wow. Wow. This almost sounds snowflakey. I'm sorry. No, but, but seriously, <laughs> Harvard Business Review, this is yeah. a fascinating article. Yeah. One CFO commented that they now avoid inviting company accountants to their strategy meetings. And another said that a CPA designation, a CPA certification is considered a disqualification for a top finance position. Well, that does sound so much like the top. But you remember, Dave, any crash that we've been through that's predictable ahead of time is always triggered by something that people say, well, gosh, we never saw it coming. It reminds me a little bit of, you know, like chaos theory, where they say if a butterfly flaps its wings in Mississippi, you know, months later, there's a cyclone or a hurricane somewhere else in the world. I mean, 
we can go back and we can say, well, gosh, we knew that there'd be a cyclone, but we had no idea it was the butterfly. We talked about Uber. That may or may not go their direction, but they're going to have to start making money at some point. Yeah. I, this is one of the things I like about the Prector folks. I don't agree with all their conclusions, but I do appreciate their analysis on mood and culture and some of those They're shifts. looking for signals. Yeah, because honestly, I yeah. mean, when you start talking about a CPA certification being a disqualification to be in finance in a tech company, you're talking about a cultural decision, right? Yeah. You're, you're suggesting that there is a mood that, you know, we need to be a little bit more aggressive. Dude, Gap, stop counting. Gap Dude. versus non-gap yeah. accounting. I mean, again, gap versus non-gap is the difference between putting the pedal to the metal and managing a business conservatively for the next hundred years, not the next hundred days. And when you're talking about capital burn rates, the, the, you need to worry about the next hundred days and the capital raise and the next round of funding, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Silicon Valley, CFOs on this point of, of, of the butterfly effect, you know, flaps its wings in one part of the world. There's a causal chain of events, unforeseeable consequences closer to home. One of the largest sources of funding of liquidity in the tech space in recent years has been Saudi Arabia. Boy, they've been in the news a lot, haven't yeah, they? So connect these dots. Yeah. Connect these dots mm -hmm. and see how this sits for not only your unicorns, these young upstart companies that are worth now a, a billion dollars or more. That's what they call a unicorn. If you have a in a very short period of time a billion dollar market cap or more in a short just you know in, in their infancy they've gone very quickly. What happened here a few weeks ago in Turkey with uh, Khashoggi, the journalist? Mm -hmm. right. He's murdered by the Saudi government. And You've got Silicon Valley startups, which have taken so much money from the Saudi Arabian government. And again, you're talking about a significant PR problem straight out of the gates, because who are you partnering with? I mean, it, it, it becomes very awkward moving forward to receive funds. Richard Branson is looking at a billion dollar fundraising deal with Saudi Arabia or was up until the Khashoggi event. Right. And now he's like, I can't do this. This is not going to work. Why? Because he understands the PR nightmare that that is. So first of all, a PR problem. Second of all, a funding problem. And for some of these young companies, that is very significant. Jawad Mian is a writer, an analyst, CFA, certified financial analyst. In his report, Stray Reflections, he quotes a tech journalist, Kara Swisher, she's a very influential tech journalist. I think she's 51 years old, has been around a long time. And whether it's writing for Wired magazine or I mean, she's written for everybody mm -hmm. and she's published a couple of books. She says, anywhere you tug at any company or investment firm or venture capital, there's either Saudi money or questionable money everywhere across mm -hmm. the system. Hmm. This is her quote. This is where it ends. And if you remove the Saudis from the worldwide network, everything collapses. So, okay, let me ask you, what is the fingerprint of the Saudi kingdom then? I mean, because obviously the news can take things one direction, but we also seem behind the scenes that uh, if there's a lot of money behind something, usually you start to see strange outcomes as far as pursuing people who would kill people, what have you. Well, the Saudi kingdom has vested more than in the last two years. They've put more money into the Silicon Valley than the Chinese have, for instance, since 2000, every year combined. In the last two years, they put more in than China has over the last 18 years? Correct. Correct. They are the largest single VC investors around. And, you know, a couple of things that they've done here recently, they flipped $45 billion to SoftBank for their venture capital fund, technology fund, and SoftBank's talking about launching another $100 billion fund, and the Saudis have said, we'll be the first ones in. We want to be half of that fund. Again, you burst the unicorn bubble, and I'm not sure that the NASDAQ 100 isn't far behind it. It's You're implicating big names in sort of a knock-on effect. And yeah, you look at the butterfly, the dismembering of NASDAQ comes from what? The same event in Turkey. But isn't it strange, Dave? Okay, we've watched Tesla continue to lose money over and over and over. I mean, they're not making any money yet. Look at Tesla shares. Right. No, no, no. Well, and this goes back to an interesting question that we had on the third quarter tactical short conference call with Doug Nolan. Transcripts are at MWealthM if you're interested in, in looking at those. It's only about the first 30, 40 minutes that are formal remarks and then the rest are Q&A. But that was what I wanted to mention. That the question that was repeated not once but three times in what was sent to us, and I only mentioned it once for the sake of time, 
But if a company like Tesla continues to burn through billions of investor cash on a quarterly basis, burning it up, and the market is setting up for a decline with particular cruelty meted out for those that don't operate sustainably, that are perpetually having to go to the market and get investor cash. Like a Tesla. Why not short Tesla? Right. That's the question that listeners were asking. Why wouldn't you short Tesla? This seems like a layup. Let's just short Tesla. I mean, it's not sustainable. They're not making money. If there's going to be pressure in Techlandia, this is a company that's going to pay the price. They will pay the price. In our in-house strategy sessions, Doug Nolan continues to emphasize that In his experience, it's the wrong time to short individual names. It's not that some aren't going to be profitable. It works. But the risks in the early stage of market deterioration are too unbalanced. And this is coming from a man who's probably more experienced on the short side of the market than almost anyone. Well, did you notice Tesla's share price behavior last week? It was up 38% in one week. And before you get real enthusiastic about, hey, wait, I wish I had owned that, you realize that's short covering, right? Mm-hmm. That That is shorts that are forced to cover and they fed a buying frenzy, closing out their positions to avoid greater losses. You know, if you're the average investor saying, I want some of that, you just missed the point. You just missed the point. Well, so I ask, okay, because when you see weaknesses in these markets, the first thing you can think of is, all right, well, if I see a weakness and nobody else does, why wouldn't I short something? But shorting is an art. It's a science, but it's beyond that, isn't it? Well, exactly. It's a feel. Like Doug Nolan, he knows things that I don't because of history and pain. (laughs) Well, I think, I mean, I might even say this. Let me try that on differently. Maybe it's neither an art nor a science, but just a rigorous analytical process. And what that leads you to is taking a certain number of risks, and these are managed speculations. And if you don't have principles and rules in place that you're following, which takes, I mean, a particular mindset, it takes a unique disposition. You can't do it effectively. And I would say Doug does that effectively. I can count his global peer group on one hand. You know, these are folks that understand the market, can operate in that space and do it effectively. Again, there's there's very few out there that could even be considered as peers. Oftentimes you've brought out the fact that the direction of a market sometimes is relatively boring and then all of a sudden very exciting the other direction. And that can often tell you where you're going long term. I'll give you an example. Last week, we saw this huge rally in the stock market. That had characteristics of a bear market rally. In other words, the longer term trend now is probably a bear But you have the spikes on the upside, just like when you're in a bull market and you have those surprises to the downside. They can be much more extreme. Oh, that's right. So the counter trend moves always tend to be much more extreme. So to see a massive rally like we did last week, and I mean, the volatility was off the charts. The Goldman Sachs most short index surged 9% last week off the Monday lows. The semiconductor sector you saw individual names rise anywhere from 14 to 24% last week off of the lows. Deutsche Bank rose off its lows by 11%. Hong Kong, the financials in Hong Kong specifically, were off their lows 8.3%. Mm-hmm. And you, just, you could go anywhere. Kevin, you could go from Argentina to South Africa, and you had massive short covering. Much of it was triggered by a politically savvy announcement from Trump that a deal was being struck with the Chinese. Yeah, the timing was pretty good. How does that translate? Uh, trade war dynamics should fade as a global concern. Maybe that was it. Maybe looking and saying, hey, if any of that is resolved, then tensions are off and Republicans are more likely to keep the House. Mm-hmm. You know, We'll be able to tell you at the end of this next week what it means as we watch the market either blow up, implode, or move to the moon. But you know what we saw last week was absolutely fascinating. All this based on a positive phone conversation with Xi. The news created a lot of volatility going into the weekend, and it was prior to the election. Certainly convenient, very political, and we can circle back around to China in a minute. Dave, listening to last week's interview with Ed Easterling, that that was a fascinating interview. We got great comments on it. There's so much to learn from it. But actually, he sounded like he was downplaying uh, share buybacks, companies buying back their shares. And we know that that can be a signal for a crash. And I'll just read a quote here. Big U.S. companies spent more money on buying back shares than they did on capital expenditures in the first half of 2018. The last time that happened for two straight quarters was just before the crisis in 2008. 
according to the chart from Deutsche Bank. So share buybacks, when companies are actually saying, you know, I don't think we're going to go ahead and expand. You know, you talked about not needing to make money, thinking, well, we don't really need to have capital expenditures, which is what a business does. Let's just go ahead and buy back our shares, raise the earnings per share by doing so. Right. Well, I mean, I think I've been clear on where I stand on the buyback issue. There is a traditional approach to that, and there is an acceptable place for share buybacks. And, you know, if you've not wanted to increase your dividend because it's a long-term outflow and you don't want to obligate yourself to that or increase your dividend payout ratio, you can say, well, are there other ways that I can return shareholder value? Well, especially when the prices are low. When PE is low, that was Ed Easterling's main point last week, that's when you do it. But even if you just applied the traditional understanding, regardless of the price of the shares, you could say we're returning shareholder value. For me, the bigger contrast is what the executives are doing with their own shares versus what they're doing with the company capital and buying back shares. So I'm not relenting on sort of the gaming of the news cycle because every quarter you've got companies who are presenting their quarterly results and the earnings per share is if they shrink the shares outstanding, they can play with the earnings per share results and again, game the news cycle, give you the good news that Everyone wants to hear so that the share price goes up. And that game gets played all the time. Do what I say, but not what I do. Because they're also selling their own shares. And that's my critical point. Exactly. That's the contrast that I think is irksome. You know, we look at insider selling, and that's the issue. Because as share buybacks have been increasing, insider selling has bumped up simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It strikes me the wrong way. You know, you've got fiduciaries, these are corporate executives, not managing in most instances their own businesses, but they're fiduciaries for shareholders, and they're willing to spend other people's money right, OPM. to buy shares from the market while personally unloading their positions in the same company. Hmm. It's consistent in my mind with a cyclical turn from a bull to a bear. And this is where I think you look and you say to yourself, what is the smart money doing? There's several categories of smart money. One certainly is the C-suite. So if you're, if your chief operating officer, your chief financial officer, your chief executive officer, if they're watching sales figures, if they understand margins either expanding or compressing, if they're anticipating and forecasting and then start to take action with their own shares, either buying or selling, it signifies something significant. And, you know, I mean, just by contrast, by contrast, look at the gold mining industry today. There's about a half dozen big gold miners that have had healthy insider buying this year. Right. They know something. They're buying their own shares because of that or holding. They're holding at least. I'll give you one example. What does it mean to you if you read this and this happened this year? What does it mean to you if a CFO adds to his existing shares with a $25 million cash purchase of the company he's managing? Hmm. That's a cash purchase, right? Does that send a signal? Sign me up. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so now, right. You're, now you're talking about one of the big boys in the gold space because they see a cyclical turn. They see it turning. Yeah. And, you know, I would bet on the gold space. Look at how compressed it's gotten. The combined market cap is $25 billion. That's every gold mine on the planet today is squeezed into $25 billion. You realize your cryptocurrency's combined market cap is like $250 billion, almost 10 times the entire production capacity of the gold market. Mm. which is 4,000 tons per year. It's pretty small in the financial universe. Gold shares, of course, what do they need? They need a higher gold price. <laughs> if, if you're going to see them go from low valuations to high valuations, and I think that's something we're likely to see. I think that's something even the impatient, even the impatient listener is likely to see. Do you remember? Now, I know you do, actually. That's a stupid question. <laughs> when Southern California real estate started to turn down. I'm thinking about that 2006 period when things had just been going gangbusters, but 2006 the signals were there. And you know, I've got a really good friend. Actually, we have a mutual friend who's leaving Durango after 25, 26 years, and they're buying California real estate. This person knows the real estate market really well, but it's different. It's like a doctor. Doctors, a lot of times, don't necessarily eat the healthiest meals, okay? <laughs> I remember hearing about a convention of heart surgeons and the line at McDonald's uh, when they had a break at this convention. And it was like, well, ooh, that's not good. Well, this person who's moving to California, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. He's been known as Mr. Real Estate here in Durango. Problem is, I'm wondering if he's not buying real estate at the top 
of the California market because we're starting to see a turn here. If it continues, it could be bad. We subscribe. One of the many pieces of research we look at is uh, a gentleman who publishes analysis on Southern California real estate. Right. And he makes the claim, and it's been pretty consistently proven that what happens in Southern California is kind of the trend setting for the rest of the nation. So that idea is worth keeping in mind. Southern California leads the housing market. Yeah. It's led the trends in the national housing market for a number of decades. So it is of greater consequence. I mean, we, we can look at the Case Shiller 20 price composite, that index, and, you know, it was down in the third quarter by five and a half percent at the end of the quarter. Mm -hmm. But far more important, and I think of greater consequence, is that new and existing homes and condo sales were down by greater than 18% in September. That's the slowest September since 2007. That's what I'm talking about. It, it's <laughs> reminiscent. Yeah. Well, and I don't know that we've had much of a price correction, but you're starting to see the volume trends move in the direction that precedes the price trends. Right? Is, because, that, is that interest rates? I mean, is it the cost of borrowing that's causing that? Well, I mean, it's both, right? We've talked about rising borrowing costs. We've also talked about rising prices and how that's discouraging first-time home buyers because affordability becomes a major issue. Right. Affordability and, and is Young the people can't afford real estate right now, Dave. They're still paying off school loans. That's a big deal. The housing ecosystem, it requires little fish and big fish. For prices to move across the spectrum, you have to have the first time home buyer pushing out and pushing upward the previous owner. And then you're pushing them up into the next higher real estate echelon. Mm -hmm. So if you take away the entry level, demand across the entire spectrum ultimately is lacking. And I've read the argument that it's a lack of supply that's constraining the lower end. And I think it's not a lack of housing supply as much as it is an excess in personal debt. So you're mm -hmm. talking about student loans, particularly for the group that's feeding that first time home purchase. And that is constraining the first time home buyer. Pervasive weakness among your home builders has been a cause of concern. You know, we've talked for the last six months about copper and the fact that the home builders have not participated in this economic growth phase. So as GDP is increasing, there's some things that should be moving that are not moving and it's a bit of a tell. So when you're looking at weakness in the autos, when you're looking at weakness in the home builders, when you're looking at a couple of key commodities that are sort of the tells for robustness in economic activity and you're not getting them, you have to stop and think. Two or three years ago, you started talking, actually before Trump got into office, you started talking about what would have to happen when you start to see these slowdowns, where deficit spending, federal deficit spending, and a fiscal push by the government, what that does, in a way, it's a little like adding QE to the system or lowering interest rates artificially. It gives a stimulus. Now, granted, it's not paid for. It's deficit spent. But if we start to see enough of a slowdown, do you think that's going to come out with Trump, federal deficit spending? Sure. And if you go back to 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, as you began to see the crisis unfold, the monetary guns were blazing mm -hmm. and they were doing most of the work. And your central bankers were doing a little bit of grousing. They were complaining about the fact that there was no fiscal effort, really, and that it should be matched with some fiscal effort. So when the monetary expansion largely ended in 2014 here in the United States, we've been remained accommodative in terms of rates, but a lot of the QE programs wound down in 2014. There was a pause, and now we're seeing fiscal policy measures come in, right? And I think a lot of the deficit spending that we're seeing here in 2016, 17, 18, in the end, I think that's what is driving GDP growth. It's deficit spending. And I think that's going to be responsible for the GDP growth we have maybe next year too. Without real estate expanding, because that does pull on the GDP, doesn't it? To some degree, yeah. And the GDP numbers, if you look at the Commerce Department numbers here in the last week or so, we were at a 4.2% growth rate in the second quarter. We're at a 3.5% growth rate in the third quarter, decelerating and moving towards what is more of a normal range. As Ed suggested last week, we should be around 3%. That's been normal, except for the last, you know, since the year 2000, it's averaged more like 1.9. David Rosenberg at Gluskin Chef, he points out that without real estate expanding, there is a broad-based drag on GDP growth. And I think that's what we're going to see in 2019 because real estate has not participated. It has not been the booster. And this is what he says. The drag on GDP growth is not 
going to come strictly from the direct impact of a housing slowdown, but also from the fact that the housing market, while it's a small share of GDP, it has the most powerful multiplier impact on the rest of the economy. There's going to be a spreading impact to financial services, into legal services, architectural services, and into related forms of construction and land services. That's the end of Rosenberg's comments, but fundamentals have deteriorated within the housing market and are showing signs of that even more so, as we mentioned with Southern California, a bear market rally. This is what we've seen in the equity markets here in the last few days. They are as severe as they are swift. You've got the home builders, which have suffered all year long, and they finally had a little bit of relief. Again, bear market rally. Mm-hmm. They had a short covering rally. They were up 11% last week before they settled into about a 7.3% gain at the close on Friday. Right. But the long-term trend is down. A bear market rally is severe and rapid to the upside. That's right. Just like a bull market correction is short and swift to the downside. One of the major new themes uh, since Trump has been in is trade war. Is that over? I mean, now that we've got the potential of talks with China, is the trade war over? (laughs) The potential for talks with China has been there every day since 2016. Right. And it just kind of depends on what rhetoric is is favorable for not only the campaign trail, but also sort of the news cycle. But now that the elections are over, I mean, is the trade war over? Do we have good news coming from China? Well, I think last week, let's talk about that for a second, because the Friday campaign speech, Trump said... And this is his words. He wants to do it. He's talking about (laughs) both sides are are making it sound like the other relented. Yeah. He wants to do it. Yeah. He said this. They want to make a deal. Yeah. Sounds like Monty Hall. Right. Let's make a deal. So the Chinese state media was clear. They followed up immediately on Trump's comments that they want to make a deal. They wanted to clarify that the call was originated from Trump. Uh. Right. So it it was, it was not like, no, no, no. He called me. He called me. Sure. We want to do a deal. We don't know. But does anyone know what the terms of the deal are? Have they flushed anything out or is this a phone call that you get to talk about just before the elections? I mean, that really is what we're talking about. Right. And I'd say, here's what you have to keep in mind. You have to keep in mind that the, the South China Sea territorial expansion, the steady displacement of other leading nations economically in the G20 in recent years. This is the trend in play for China. And the trend would suggest a long game of global presence. Yeah. The trend would suggest that China is capturing greater financial flows, that they are designing an economy to manufacture higher end goods, not trinkets and t-shirts for Walmart, but higher end technology and distributing that all over the world. So the long-term objectives for the Chinese have not been met. And the long-term objectives of the United States have not been met. Doing a little review on our relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And we have relationships of convenience. If we see our long-term benefit, think about what we did to pull the carpet out from under Mossadegh in Iran. And we helped get the Shah in place. Right. And then the Shah turned to nationalist and wasn't doing exactly what we wanted. So we pulled out our State Department. This is before the Treasury Department really got active in the foreign field. But our State Department, when they were out there. I told you so. I told you so. (laughs) Well, and that's who we put put in power. So we put in. Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah. And so this is like 1979. So right. from 53 to 79, we're playing power broker in the Middle East. We shift in 79 to supporting Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war. Right. Right. And, and it, all of these things we do on the basis of what's in it for us. Right. And I don't see that we've settled anything with the Chinese in terms of what's in it for us. If they're going to continue to march forward in terms of territorial expansion, then what's in it for us has not been determined. Well, and we do a lot of that with our treasuries and swift transfer system. And I was just reading something this morning about how Turkey, Iran, Russia, China, they're all talking to each other about moving away from the dollar. Now, that may be a long term plan. But can you imagine, okay, if the world had another option that wasn't part of this SWIFT transfer system? What we're doing with Iran is entirely inconvenient for SWIFT. And it's entirely inconvenient for the rest of the world because the UK would like to do business with Iran. Right. France would like to do business with Iran. Germany would like to do business with Iran. The Russians are doing business. And it's fascinating when you look at sort of our threats. We threaten everybody. You can't work with Iran or we'll bring 
sanctions against you. And this is the bluff that they've got with Swift right now. Yeah. You should not be clearing anything for anyone. There should be no bank transfers in or out of Iran. But do you know there's exceptions to that? Who's at the top of the list of the exceptions? The Chinese. Mm. Like we're willing to push around smaller people in smaller countries and smaller ways. But that's not a hill we've died on. You know, the dollar was a house of bricks when it was based on gold. But the dollar right now is based on $22 trillion worth of deficit. It's a house of cards. This whole thing, I think back to the 1870s, Dave, when Otto von Bismarck was holding all of Europe together just with these agreements between each other. And it ultimately, when he died, things just started falling apart until it led to 1914. And these guys were shooting at each other, and they had absolutely no idea why. They didn't know what World War I was about, <laughs> but it was because the House of Bricks had turned into a House of Cards, and the person who was holding it all together was no longer there. Well, and we ha we've had a House of Cards since 1971, when right. we moved away from Bretton Woods, which was not really a gold standard, the quasi-gold standard of the Bretton Woods, period. You'd have to go back to the real gold standard pre-1923 in the Conference of Genoa for something actual, actual, actual gold. True, yeah. true. But you're right. You've got these circumstances relating to China, which have not been settled. Not only do we not have a trade agreement, you know, past the midterms, we don't know anything about anything as it relates to the stress and strain in the financial markets caused by a trade war. Nothing's been settled there. The bigger picture is nothing has been settled with Taiwan. Nothing has been settled with the South China Sea. Right. Nothing has been settled with Iran. And these are the flashpoints which create real tensions and underlie the actual relationship between us and China. Right. We are in a competitive relationship. We're no longer in a complementary friendship that you could have argued for from the 70s and 80s forward, where they're moving towards us and we're helping them modernize, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate that's only one interpretation of those events, but we have flashpoints. Taiwan, the South China Sea, Iran, until these things are settled, I think the trade war is just the means by which we talk about the conflict, which is ongoing. It's almost as if we're in an unannounced war, an unofficial war. And the trade war is just kind of the way we talk about things. But the real issues are those things that we just talked about. Taiwan, the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands, building out military infrastructure in a place where over a third of all global commerce flows. And that's what they want. The Chinese want to be able to control the toll bridge in global trade. Dave, before we finish up, I'd just like to bring up the fact that one of the men you work with grew up in Russia and uh, he looked at America. He loves America, but he sees that they no longer are in a gold standard. And he saw what happened to other countries over in Europe and Eastern Europe when that was the case. And he pointed out to Jim Grant a way to put yourself on a personal gold standard. I, I think we have to finish with that because it, you can leave people hopeless by saying, well, we're not on a gold standard. This whole thing's going to fall apart. But we can still legally here in America put ourselves and our savings on a gold standard. Right. Now, I, the idea of everyone having savings that are legitimate. I'm talking to this gal in, in the Uber car. In Atlanta. From Venezuela. From Venezuela. Her family could have starved. I'm telling her about vaulted.com. Why? Because this is a way that she can save and that her mother can benefit from being on a gold standard. Savings and banking doesn't have to be in the traditional means anymore. Financial technology has allowed us to very easily own gold and transact, denominating our savings in gold versus greenbacks. Right. So you can establish your house on a firmer foundation and not the house of cards. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or you can call us at 800-525-9556. <laughs> This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 